Canto Two, The Descent The light was departing, the brown air drew down all the earth's creatures, calling them to rest from their day roving, as I, one man alone, prepared myself to face the double war of the journey and the pity which memory shall here set down, nor hesitate, nor err. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, be my aid, O oh, memory, recorder of the vision, here shall your true nobility be displayed. Thus I began. Poet, you who must guide me before you trust me to that arduous passage, look to me and through me. Can I be worthy? You sang how the father of Silvius, while still incorruptible flesh, won to that other world, crossing with mortal sense the immortal sill. But if the adversary of all evil, weighing his consequence, and who and what should issue from him treated him so well, that cannot seem unfitting to thinking men, since he was chosen father of Mother Rome, and of her empire by God's will and token. Both, to speak strictly, were founded and foreknown as the established seat of holiness for the successors of great Peter's throne. In that quest, which your verses celebrate, he learned those mysteries from which arose his victory and Rome's apostolate. There later came the chosen vessel Paul, bearing the confirmation of that faith, which is the one true door to life eternal. But I, how shall I dare? By whose permission? I am not Aeneas. I am not Paul. Who could believe me worthy of the vision? How, then, may I presume to this high quest and not fear my own brashness? You are wise, and will grasp what my poor words can but suggest. And one who unwills what he wills will stay strong purposes with feeble second thoughts until he spells all that first zeal away. So I hung back and balked on that dim coast till thinking had worn out my enterprise, so stout at staring and so early lost. I understand from your words, and the look in your eyes, that shadow of magnificence answered me, your soul is sunken in that cowardice that bears down many men, turning their course and resolution by imagined perils and his own shadow turns the frightened horse. To free you of this dread, I will tell you all of why I came to you, and what I heard when I first pitied you. I was a soul among the souls of Limbo, when a lady so blessed and so beautiful, I prayed her to order and command my will, called to me. Her eyes were kindled from the lamps of heaven. Her voice reached through me, tender, sweet, and low, an angel's voice, a music of its own. O oh, gracious Mantuan, whose melodies live in earth's memory and shall live on till the last motion ceases in the skies, my dearest friend and fortune's foe has strayed onto a friendless shore and stands beset by such distresses that he turns afraid from the true way. And news of him in heaven rumors my dread he has already lost. I come, afraid that I am too late risen. Fly to him, and with your high counsel pity, and with whatever need be for his good and soul salvation, help him and solace me. It is I, Beatrice, who send you to him. I come from the blessed height for which I yearn. Love called me here. When amid seraphim I stand again before my Lord, your praises shall sound in heaven. She paused and I began. O lady of that only graces that, are, that raises feeble mankind with its mortal cycle above all other works God will God's will has placed within the heaven of the smallest circle. So welcome is your command that to my sense, were it already fulfilled, it would yet seem tardy. I understand and am all obedience. But tell me how you dare to venture thus, so far from the wide heaven of your joy, to which your thoughts yearn back from the abyss. 
Since what you ask, she answered me, probes near the root of all, I will say briefly only how I have come through hell's pit without fear. Know then, O waiting and compassionate soul, that is to fear which has the power to harm, and nothing else is fearful even in hell. I am so made by God's all-seeing mercy, your anguish does not touch me. The flame of his great burning has no power upon me. There is a lady in heaven so concerned for him, I send you too, that for her sake the strict decree is broken. She has turned and called Lucia to her wish and mercy, saying, Thy faithful one is sorely pressed. In his distress I commend him to thee. Lucia, that soul of light and foe of all cruelty, rose and came to me at once where I was sitting with the ancient Rachel, saying to me, Beatrice, true praise of God, why dost thou not help him who loved thee so? For thy sake he left the vulgar crown. Dost thou not hear his cries? Canst thou not see the debt he wrestles with beside that river? No ocean can surpass for rage and fury. No soul of earth has ever wrapped to seek its good or flee its injury as I was when I had heard my sweet Lucia speak to descend from heaven and my blessed seat to you, laying my trust in that high speech that honors you and all who honor it. She spoke and turned away to hide a tear that sh shining urged me faster. So I came and freed you from the beast that drove you there, blocking the near way to the heavenly height. And now what ails you? Why do you lag? Why this heart-sick hesitation and pale fright when three such blessed ladies from heaven in their concern for you and my own pledge of the great good that waits you has been given? As flowerlets drooped and puckered in the night turn up to the returning sun and spread their petals wide on his new warmth and light, just so my wilted spirits rose again and such a heat of zeal surged through my veins that I was born anew. Thus, I began. Blessed be that lady of infinite pity, and blessed be thy taxed and courteous spirit that came so promptly on the word she gave thee. Thy words have moved my heart to its first purpose. My guide, my lord, my master now lead on. One Will sh one will shall serve the two of us in this. He turned when I had spoken, and at his back I entered on that hard and perilous track.